Platonic Studies, Part Two, by Kenneth Sylvan Guthrie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Two. Platonism, significance, progress, and results. Of all fetishes which have misled humanity, perhaps none is responsible for more error than that of originality. As if anything could be new that was true, or true that was new. The only possible lines along which novelty or progress can lie are our reports, combinations, and expressions. Some people think they have done for a poet if they have shown that he made use of suitable materials in the construction of his poem. So Shakespeare has been shown to have used whole scenes from earlier writers. So Virgil, by Macrobius, has been shown to have laid under contribution every writer then known to be worth ransacking. Dante has also been shown to have re-edited contemporary apocalypses. So Homer, even, has been shown to retell stories gathered from many sources. The result is that people generally consider Shakespeare, Virgil, or Homer great in spite of their borrowings, when, on the contrary, the statement should be that they were great because of their rootage in the best of their period. In other words, they are great, not because of their own personality, which in many cases has dropped out of the ken of history, but because they more faithfully, completely, and harmoniously represent their periods than other now forgotten writers. Therein alone lay their cosmic value and their assurance of immortality. They are the voices of their ages, and we are interested in the significance of their age, not in them personally. It is from this standpoint that we must approach Plato. Of his personality, what details are known are of no soteriologic significance, and the reason why the world has not been able to get away from him, and probably never will, is that he sums up prior Greek philosophy in as coherent a form as is possible, without doing too great Procrustean violence to the elements in question. This means that Plato did not fuse them all into one absolutely rigid, coherent, consistent system, in which case his utility would have been very much curtailed. The very form of his writings, the dialogue, left each element in the natural living condition to survive on its merits, not as an authoritative oracle or platonic pronunciamento or creed. For details, the reader is referred to Zeller's fuller account of these pre-platonic elements, but we may summarize as follows. The physical elements to which the hylicists had in turn attributed finality, Plato united into Pythagorean matter, which remained as an element of dualism. The world of nature became the becoming of Heraclitus. Above that he placed the being of Parmenides, in which the concepts of Socrates found place as ideas. These he identified with the numbers and harmonies of Pythagoras, and united them in an Eleatic unity of many as an intelligible world, or reason, which he owed to Anaxagoras. The chief idea, that of the good, was Megaro Socratic. His cosmology was that of Timaeus. His psychology was based on Anaxagoras as mind, on Pythagoras as immortal. His ethics are Socratic. His politics are Pythagorean. Who, therefore, would flout Plato has all earlier Greek philosophy to combat, and whoever recognizes the achievements of the Hellenic mind 
will find something to praise in Plato. When, therefore, we are studying Platonism, we are only studying a blending of the rays of Greece, and we are chiefly interested in Greece as one of the latest, clearest, and most kindred expressions of human thought. If, however, we should seek some one special platonic element, it would be that genuineness of reflection, that sincerity of thought, that makes of his dialogues no cut and dried literary figments, but soul tragedies with living, breathing, interest, and emotion. Plato thus practiced his doctrine of the double self, the higher and the lower selves, of which the higher might be described as superior to oneself. In his later period, that of the laws, he applied this double psychology to cosmology, thereby producing doubleness in the world soul. Besides, the good one appears the evil one, which introduces even into heaven things that are not good. It was only a step from this to the logical deduction of Xenocrates that these things in heaven were spirits or guardians, both good and evil, assisting in the administration of human affairs. Such is the result of doubleness introduced into anthropology. Introduced into cosmology, it establishes Pythagorean indefinite duality as the principle opposing the unity of goodness. The next step was taken by Plutarch. The evil demons had, in Stoic phraseology, been called physical, and so, in regard to matter, they came to stand in the relation of soul to body. Original matter, therefore, became twofold. Matter itself and its moving principle, the soul of matter. This was identified with the worse world soul by a development or historical event which was the ordering of the cosmos or creation. This, then, was the state of affairs at the advent of Numenius. Although his chief interest lay in practical comparative religion, he tried philosophically, to return to a mythical original Platonism, or Pythagoreanism. What Plato did for earlier Greek speculation, Numenius did for post-Platonic development. He harked back to the latter Platonic stage, which taught the evil world soul. He included the achievements of Plutarch, the soul of matter, and the trine division of a separate principle such as providence. To the achievement of Xenocrates he was drawn by two powerful interests, the Egyptian, Hermetic, Serapistic, in connection with the evil demons, and the Pythagorean, in connection with the indefinite duality. Thus, Numenius's history of the Platonic succession is not a delusion. Numenius really did sum up the positive Platonic progress, not omitting even Maximus of Tyre's philosophical hierarchic explanation of the emanative or participative streaming forth of the divine. But Numenius was not merely a philosopher, of this gathering of Platonic achievements he made a religion. In this he was also following the footsteps of Pythagoras, who limited his doctrines to a group of students. But Numenius did not merely copy Pythagoras. Numenius modernized him, connecting up the Platonic doctrinal aggregate with the mystery rites current in his own day. Nor did Numenius shirk any unpleasant responsibilities of a restorer of Platonism. He continued the traditional academico-stoical feud. Strange to say, the last great Stoic philosopher, Poseidonius, Anno Domini 135-151, hailed from Numenius's hometown, Apamea, so that this Stoic feud 
may have been forced on Numenius from home personalities or conditions. It would seem that in Numenius and Posidonius we have a re-enactment of the tragedy of Greek philosophy on a Syrian theatre, where dogmatic Stoicism died, and Platonism admitted Oriental ideas. Apamea, however, had not yet ended its role in the development of thought. Numenius's pupil, Amelius, had gathered, copied, and learned by heart his master's works. It was in Apamea that he adopted as son Hostilianus Hesychius. After a twenty-four years' sojourn in Rome, he returned to Apamea, and was dwelling there still at the time of the death of Plotinus, with whom he had spent that quarter of a century. Here, then, we have a historical basis for a connection between Numenius and Plotinus, which we have elsewhere endeavoured to demonstrate from inner grounds. It was, however, by Amelius that philosophy is drawn into the maelstrom of the world city. Plotinus, in his early periods, a Numenian Platonist, will later go over to Stoicism and conduct a polemic with the Gnostics, the Alexandrian heirs of Platonic dualism, under the influence of the Stoic Porphyry. However, Plotinus will not publicly abandon Platonism. He will fuse the two streams of thought and interpret in Stoic terms the fundamentals of Platonism, producing something which, when translated into Latin, he will leave as inheritance to all the ages. Not in vain, therefore, did Amelius transport the torch of philosophy to the capital. Let us in a few words dispose of the general outlines of the fate of the Platonic movement. Plotinus was no religious leader. He was, before everything else, a philosopher, even if he centered his efforts on the practical aspects of the ecstatic union with God. Indeed, Porphyry relates to us the incident in which this matter was objectively exemplified. At the new moon, Amelius invited him to join in a visit to the mystery celebrations. Plotinus refused, saying that they would have to come to him, not he go over to them. This, then, is the chief difference between Numenius and Plotinus and the result would be a recrudescence of pure philosophic contentions, as those of Plotinus against the Gnostics. As to the general significance of Plotinus, we must here resume what we have elsewhere detailed, that with the change of editors from Amelius to Porphyry, Plotinus changed from Numenian or Pythagorean dualism to Stoic monism in which the philosophic feud was no longer with the Stoics, but with the Alexandrian descendants of Numenian dualism, the Gnostics. Even though Plotinus showed practical religious aspects in his studying and experiencing the ecstasy, there is no record of any of his pupils being encouraged to do so, and therefore Plotinus remains chiefly a philosopher. The successors of Plotinus could not remain on this purely philosophic standpoint. Instead of practicing the ecstasy, they followed the Gnostics in theorizing about practical religious reality in their cosmology and theology, which took on, more or less, the shape of magic not inconsiderably aided by Stoic allegoric interpretations of myths, as in Porphyry's Cave of the Nymphs. What Plato did for early Greek philosophy, what Numenius did for post-Platonic thought, that Proclus Diadocus, the successor, did for Plotinus and his followers. 
for the first time since Numenius we find again a comparative method. By this time religion and philosophy have fused in magic, and so, instead of a comparative religion, we have a comparative philosophy. Proclus was the first genuine commentator, quoting authorities on all sides. He was sufficient of a philosopher to grasp Neoplatonism as a school of thought, and far from paying any attention to Ammonius, as recent philosophy has done, as source of Neoplatonism, he traces the movement as far as Plutarch, calling him the father of us all, inasmuch as he introduced the conception of hypostasis. Evidently, Proclus looked upon this as the centre of Neoplatonic development, and therefore we shall be justified in a closer study of this conception, and we may even say that its historic destiny was a continuation of the mainstream of creative Greek philosophy, or, if you prefer, of Platonism, or Numenianism, or even Platinian thought. Did Greek philosophy die with Proclus? The political changes of the time forced alteration of dialect and position, but the accumulations of mental achievements could not perish. This again we owe to Proclus. Besides being the first great commentator, he precipitated his most valuable achievements in logical form, in analytic arrangement, in the form of crystal-clear propositions, theorems, demonstrations, and corollaries. Such a highly abstract form was inevitable, inasmuch as Numenius had turned away from Aristotelian observation of nature. Just like the Hebrew thinkers, who finally became commentators and abstract theorizers, Nothing else was left for a philosophy without connection with experiment, when whittled down by the keenest intellects of the times. This abstract method, still familiarly used by geometry, reappeared among the schoolmen, notably in Thomas Aquinas. Later it persisted with Spinoza and Descartes. However, Rising experimentalism has gradually terminated it, its last form appearing in Kant and Hegel. Kant's Ding an sich, reached after abstracting all qualities, is only a restatement of Numenius and Plotinus's subject, or definition of matter, and Hegel's dialectic, beginning with being and not being, more definitely proclaimed by Plotinus, goes as far back as the Eleatics and Heraclitus, not to mention Plato. However, Kant and Hegel are the great masters of modern thought, and although at one time the rising tide of materialism and cruder forms of evolution threatened to obscure it, Karl Pearson's Grammar of Science generous as it is in invective against Kant and Hegel, in modern terms clinches Barclay's and Kant's demonstration of the reality of the supersensual, thus vindicating Plotinus, and before him Numenius. It must not be supposed that in thus tracing the springs of our modern thought we necessarily approve of all the thought of Plotinus, Numenius, or Plato. On the contrary, they were far more likely to have committed logical errors than we are, because they were hypnotized by the glamour of the terms they used, which to us are mere laboratory tools. The best way to prove this will be to appraise, at its logical value for us, Plotinus's discussion of matter elsewhere studied in its value for us. End of Platinic Studies, Part 2
Sylvan Guthrie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. 3. Plotinus's View of Matter. We have elsewhere pointed out the hopelessness of escaping either aspect of the problem of the one and the many, and that the attempt of the Stoics to avoid the Platonic dualism by a materialistic monism was merely a change of names, the substance of the dualism remaining as the opposition of the contraries, such as active and passive, male and female, the predominant elements, etc. Plotinus, in his abandonment of Numenian dualism, and championing of Stoicism, undertaking the feud with the Gnostics, the successors of Numenius, must therefore have inherited the same difficulties of thought, and we shall see how in spite of his mental agility he is caught in the same traditional meshes, and that these irreducible difficulties occur in each one of his three periods of life the Eustachian, the Amelian, and the Porphyrian. In the Amelian he teaches two matters, the physical and the intelligible, by which device he seeks to avoid the difficulties of dualism, crediting to intelligible matter any necessary form of being, thus pushing physical matter into the outer darkness of non-being. So, intelligible matter is still a form of being, and we still hold to monism, as intelligible matter may participate in the good, while matter, physical, remains evil, being a deprivation of good, not possessing it. This, of course, is dualism, and he thus has a convenient pun on the word matter, by which he can be monist or dualist as the fancy takes him, or as exigencies demand. This participation, therefore, does not eliminate the dualism, while formally professing monism. Therefore Plotinus tries to choose between monism and dualism by surreptitiously accepting both. In the Porphyrian period he rejected the idea of intelligible matter. Forced to fashion entirely new arguments, he seizes as tool the Aristotelian distinction between potentiality and actuality, or energy as dynamic accomplishment. But no logical device can help a man to pull himself up by his bootstraps. If by being you mean existence, then its opposite must be negative, and to speak of real non-being as something that shares being is an evasion. To say that matter remains non-being, while having the possibility of future being, which, however, can never be actualized, is mere juggling with words. Even if matter is no more than a weak, confused image, it is not non-being. If it is a positive lie, it is not non-being. To talk of a higher degree of non-being, that is real non-being, is simply to confuse the actuality intended with the thought of non-being, which of course is a thought as actually existing as any other. Moreover, if matter is imperishable, it cannot be non-being, and if it possesses being potentially, it certainly is not non-existence. The Aristotelian potentiality could help to create this evasion, but did not remove its real nature. It merely supplied Plotinus with an intellectual device to characterize something that would not be actually existing as still having the possibility of existence. But this is not non-existence. In another writing of this period, 
Plotinus continues his evasions about the origin and nature of matter. First he grants that it is something that is not original, being later than many earthly and all intelligible objects, although if he had returned to the conception of intelligible matter, he would have been at liberty to assert the originality of the latter. Then he holds that being is common to both form and matter, as to quality, but not as to quantity. Last, he closes the paragraph by saying that perhaps form and matter do not come from the same origin, as there is a difference between them. In Plotinus's third, or Eustachian period, the same evasions occur. For instance, he limits being to goodness. Then he acknowledges the existence of evil things, and derives their evil quality from a primary evil, the image of essence, the being of evil. That he is conscious of having strained a point is evident from the fact that he adds the clause, if there can be a being of evil. Likewise, while discussing evil, which is generally recognized because in our daily lives there is positive pain and sensations of pain, he defines evil as lack of qualities. To say that evil is not such as to form, but as to nature is opposite to form, is nonsense, inasmuch as life is full of positive evils, as Numenius brought out in 16, and Plotinus acknowledged even in spite of his polemic against the Gnostics. Finally, Plotinus takes refuge in a miracle, as explanation of unparticipating participation. This is commentary enough. It shows he realized the futility of any arguments. But Plotinus was not alone in despairing of establishing an iron-clad system. Before him, Numenius had just as pathetically despaired of a logical dualism, and he acknowledged in Fragment 16 that Pythagoras's arguments, however true, were wonderful and opposed to the belief of a majority of humanity. In other words, monism is as unsatisfactory to reason as dualism. This was the chief point of agreement between Pythagoras and the Stoics, and pragmatism has in modern times attempted to show a way out by a higher sanction of another kind. Perhaps the reader may be interested in a side light on this subject. Truce is interested in Plotinus only because Plotinus's superrational divinity furnishes a historical foundation for Eduard Hartmann's philosophy of the unconscious. It would seem, however, to be a mistake to use the latter term, for it is true only as a doubtful corollary. If the supreme is superconscious, it is possible to describe this logically as unconscious. But generally, however, unconsciousness is a term used to denote the subconscious rather than the superconscious, and the use of that term must inevitably entail misunderstandings. It would be better, then, to follow pragmatism into the superconscious rather than to sink with Hartmann into the subconscious. It was directly from Plotinus that Hartmann took his expression beyond good and evil. Having watched Numenius for Platonic dualism and Plotinus for Stoic monism, both appeal to a miracle as court of last resort. We may now return to that result of Platonism which has left the most vital impress on our civilization, its conception of the divine. End of Platonic Studies, Part 3
Plotinic Studies, Part 4, by Kenneth Sylvan Guthrie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. 4. Plotinus's Creation of the Trinity. Elsewhere, we have seen how Numenius waged the traditional academic feud with the Stoics bravely, but uselessly, inasmuch as it was chiefly a difference of dialects that separated them. In the course of this struggle, Numenius had made certain distinctions within the divinity, which were followed by Amelius, but are difficult to trace in Plotinus because, as a matter of principle, Plotinus was averse to thus dividing the divinity. Why so? Because he was waging a struggle with the Gnostics, who had followed in the footsteps of the Hermetic writings, with their demiurge and seven governors. Philo, Judeus, with his five subordinate powers, Numenius and Amelius, with their triply divided first and second gods, after which we come to Basilides, with his seven powers, Saturninus, with his seven angels, and Valentinus, with his thirty-three eons. This new feud between Plotinus and the Gnostics is, however, just as illusory as the earlier one between Numenius and the Stoics. It was merely a matter of dialects. Plotinus, indeed, found fault with the Gnostics for making divisions within the divinity. But wherever he himself is considering the divinity minutely, he, just as much as the Gnostics, is compelled to draw distinctions, even though he avoided acknowledged divisions by borrowing from Plutarch a new, non-Platonic, non-Numenian, but Aristotelian, Stoic, Cornutus and Sextus, and still Alexandrian, Philo, Septuagint, Lucian, Term, Hypostasis. The difference he pretended to find between the Gnostic distinctions within the divinity and his new term, hypostasis, was that the former introduced manifoldness into the divinity by splitting him, thus allowing the influence of matter to pervade the pure realm of being. Hypostasis, on the contrary, wholly existed within the realm of pure being and was no more than a trend, a direction, a characterization, a function, a face, or orientation of activity of the unaffected unity of being. Thus the divinity retained its unity and still could be active in several directions, without admixture of what philosophy had till then recognized as constituting manifoldness. But reflection shows that this is a mere quibble, an evasion, a paralogism, a quaternio terminorum, a pun. How it came about, we shall attempt to show below. In thus achieving a manifoldness in the divinity without divisions, Plotinus did indeed keep out of the divinity the splitting influence of matter, which it was now possible to banish to the realm of unreality, as a negation and a lie. Monism was thus achieved. But at the cost of two errors, denial of the common-sense reality of the phenomenal world, and that quibble about three hypostases without manifoldness, genuinely a distinction without a difference. This intellectual dishonesty must not, however, be foisted on Aristotle or Plutarch. The latter, for instance, adopted this term 
only to denote the primary and original characteristics or distinctions within existing things from a comparative study of aristotle's de anima and plato's phaedo these five hypostases were the divinity mind soul forms immanent in inorganic nature hexus in stoic dialect and to matter as apart from these forms so important to neoplatonism did this term seem to proclus that he did not hesitate to say that plutarch by the use thereof became our first forefather he therefore develops it further among the hidden and intelligible gods are three hypostases the first is characterized by the good it thinks the good itself and dwells with the paternal monad the second is characterized by knowledge and resides in the first thought while the third is characterized by beauty and dwells with the most beautiful of the intelligible they are the causes from which proceed three monads which are self-existent but under the form of a unity and as in a germ in their cause where they manifest they take a distinct form faith truth and love cousin's title du vrai du beau et du bien this trinity pervades all the divine worlds in order to understand the attitude of plotinus on the subject we must try to put ourselves in his position in the first place on porphyry's own admission he had added to platonism peripatetic and stoic views from aristotle his chief borrowings were the categories of form and matter and the distinction between potentiality and actuality as well as the aristotelian psychology of various souls to the stoics he was drawn by their monism which led him to drop the traditional academico-stoic feud or rather to take the side of the stoics against numenius the platonist dualist and the dualistic successors the gnostics but there was a difference between the stoics and plotinus the stoics assimilated spirit to matter while plotinus reminiscent of plato preferred to assimilate matter to spirit still he used their terminology and categories including the conception of a hypostasis or form of existence with this equipment he hailed to the traditional platonic trinity of the letters the king the intellect and the soul philosophically however he had received from numenius the inheritance of a double name of the divinity being and essence as a thinker he was therefore forced to accommodate numenius to plato and by adding to numenius's name of the divinity to complete numenius's theology by numenius's own cosmology this then he did by adding as third hypostasis the aristotelian dynamic energy but as intellect is permanent how can energy arise therefrom here this eternal puzzle is solved by distinguishing energy into indwelling and outflowing as indwelling energy constitutes intellect but its energetic nature could not be demonstrated except by outflowing which produces a distinction similarly there are two kinds of heat that of the fire itself and that emitted by the fire so that the fire may remain itself while exerting its influence without it is thus also there in that it remains itself in its inmost being and 
from its own inherent perfection and energy, the developed energy assumes hypostasis, as if from a dynamis that is great, nay greatest, and so it joins the essence and the being. For that was beyond all being, and that was the dynamis of all things, and already was all things. If, then, it is all, it must be above all, consequently also above being. And if this is all, then the one is before all, not of an essence equal to all, and this must be above being, as this is above intellect for there is something above intellect. This is the most definite statement of Plotinus's solution of the problem. Other references thereto are abundant. So we have a trinity of energy, being, and essence, and each of us, like the world soul, has an eros, which is essence and hypostasis. Reason is a hypostasis after the nous, and Aphrodite gains an hypostasis in the usia. The one is intellect, the intelligible, and usia, or energy, being, and the intelligible essence. The soul is activity. The soul is the third god. We are the third rank proceeding from the upper undivided nature, the whole being God, nous, and essence. The nous is activity and the first essence. There are three stages of the good, the king, the nous, and the soul. We find energy, thinking, and being, then the soul, the noose, and the one. We find providence threefold as in Plutarch, and three ranks of gods, demons, and world life. Elsewhere, untheologically, or rather merely philosophically, he speaks of the hypostasis of wisdom. Chenier's summary of this is that Plotinus holds that every force in the intelligible is both being and substance simultaneously, and reciprocally that no being could be conceived without hypostasis or directed force. Again, the world, the universe of things, contains three natures or divine hypostases, soul, mind, and unity which indeed are found in our own nature, and of which the divinest is unity or divinity. Let us now try to understand the matter. Why should the word hypostasis, which unquestionably in earlier times meant substance, have later come to mean distinctions within the divinity? For substance, on the contrary, represents to our mind an unity, the underlying unity, and not individual forms of existence. How did the change occur? Now, Plotinus, as we remember, found fault with the Gnostics, in that they taught distinctions within the divinity. He would therefore be disposed to remove from within the divinity those distinctions of Plotinic, Plutarchian, Numenian, or Gnostic theology, although he himself in early times did not scruple to speak of a hypostasis of wisdom, or of eros, or other matter he might be considering. Such terms of Numenius or Amelius, as he seems to ignore, are the various demiurges, the three Plutarchian providences he himself still uses. Still, all these terms he would be disposed to eradicate from within the divinity. 
as a constructive metaphysician however he could not well get along without some titles for the different phases of the divinity and even if he dispensed with the old names there would still remain as their underlying support the reality or substance of the distinction so he removed the offensive aggressive historically known and recognized terms while leaving their underlying substances or supports now substance had to become substances and to differentiate these it was necessary to interpret them as differing forms of existence the change was most definitely made by athanasius who at a synod in alexandria in anno domini three hundred sixty two fastened on the church as synonymous with hypostasis the popular term prosopon or face that this was an innovation appears from the fact that the nicene council had stated that it was heretical to say that christ was of a hypostasis different from that of the father in which case the word evidently meant still the original underlying singular substance with this official definition in vogue the original singular substance became forgotten and it became possible to speak in the plural of three faces as indeed plotinus had done in other words so necessary were distinctions in the divinity that the popular mind supplied other individual names to designate the distinctions plotinus had successfully banished for demiurges and providences no longer return thus more manifold differences re-entered into the divinity than plotinus had ever emptied out of it although under a name which the poverty of the latin language rendered as persons which represents to us individual consciousness of a far more distinctive kind than was ever implied in three phases of providence or of the demiurge thus the translation into latin clinched the illicit linguistic process and the result of plotinus's attempt to distinguish in the divinity phases so subtle as not to demand or allow of manifoldness resulted in the most pronounced differences of personality this was finally clinched by plotinus's illustration of the three faces around a single hand which established the idea of three persons masks from per sonare in one god not only in the abstract realm of metaphysics therefore is the world indebted to greek thought but even in the realm of religion a stoic reinterpretation of platonism itself reinterpreted in a different language has given a lasting inheritance to the spiritual aspirations of the ages end of platonic studies part four platonic studies part five by kenneth sylvan guthrie this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by geoffrey edwards five resemblances to christianity trinitarian significance of plotinus plotinus's date being about anno domini 262 he stands midway between the christian writings of the new testament and the council of nicaea anno domini 325 as a philosopher dealing with the kindred topics the soul and its salvation and deriving terminology and inspiration from the same sources platonism and stoicism we would expect extensive parallelism 
and correspondence. Though Plotinus does not mention any contemporaneous writings, we will surely be able to detect indirect references to Old and New Testaments. But what will be of most vital interest will be his anticipations of Nicene formulations, or reflection of current expressions of Christian philosophic comment. While we cannot positively assert this Christian development was exclusively Plotinian, we are justified in saying that the development of Christian philosophy was not due exclusively to the Alexandrian catechetical school, that what later appears as Christian theology was only earlier current Neoplatonic metaphysics, without any exclusive dogmatic connection with the distinctively Christian biography. This avoids the flat assertion of Drews that the Christian doctrine of the Trinity was dependent on Plotinus, although it admits Bouillet's more cautious statement that Plotinus was the rationalizer of the doctrine of the Trinity. This much is certain, that no other contemporaneous discussion of the Trinity has survived, if any ever existed, and we must remember that it was not until the Council of Constantinople in Anno Domini 381 that the Nicene Creed, by the addition of the Filioque Clause, became Trinitarian in a thoroughgoing way, and not until fifty years later that Augustine, again in the West, fully expressed a philosophy and psychology of the Trinity. To Plotinus, therefore, is due the historical position of protagonist of Trinitarian philosophy. Non-Christian Origin of Parallelisms to Christianity Christian parallelisms in Plotinus have a historical origin in Christian parallelisms in his sources, namely Stoicism, Numenius, and Plato. To Christian origins in Plato never has justice been done, not even by Big. His suggestion of the crucifixion of the just man, his reference to the Son of God, are only commonplaces, to which should be added many minor references. The Christian origins in Numenius are quite explicit mention of the Hebrews as among the races whose scriptures are important, of Moses among the great religious teachers, of the spirit hovering over the waters, of the names of the Egyptian magicians which, together with Pliny, he hands down to posterity. He also was said to have told many stories about Jesus in an allegorical manner. The Christian origins in Stoicism have been widely discussed, for instance by Chenier, but it is likely that this influence affected Christianity indirectly through Plotinus, along with the other Christian ideas we shall later find. At any rate, Plotinus is the philosopher who uses the term spiritual body most like the Christians. The soul is a slave to the body, and has a celestial body as well as a spiritual body. Within us are two men opposing each other, the better part often being mastered by the worse part, as thought St. Paul in the struggle between the inner and outer man. With Plotinus, the idea of procession is not only cosmic but psychological. In other words, when Plotinus speaks of the procession of the Godhead, he is not, as in Christian doctrine, depicting something unique, which has no connection with the world. He is only referring to the cosmic aspect of an evolution which, in the soul, appears as educational development. As the opposite of the soul's procession upwards, there is the soul's descent into hell, or, in other words, the soul's descent and ascension. This double aspect of man's fate 
upward or downward is referred to by Plotinus in the regular Christian term sin, as consisting in missing one's aim. The soul repents, and its duty is conversion. As a result of this conversion comes forgiveness. Old Testament References The famous terrors of Jeremiah might have come immediately through the Gnostics, who indeed may have been the persons referred to as Christians. More direct, no doubt, was God admiring his handiwork, and the soul breathing the spirit of life into animals. God is called both the I am what I am, and he is what he ought to be. He sits above the world as the king of kings. New Testament References Plotinus says that it would be a poor artist who would conceive of an animal as all covered with eyes. There is hardly such a reference outside of revelations to which we must also look for a new heaven and a new earth. Then we have practically a quotation of the Johannine prologue. In the beginning was the Logos, and by him were all things made. Light was in the beginning. We are told not to leave the world, but not to be of it. The divinity prepares mansions in heaven for good souls. Pauline references seem to be that sin exists because of the law. God is above all height or depth. The vulgar, who attend mystery banquets only to gorge, are condemned. There are several heavens. The beggarly principles and elements towards which some turn are mentioned. The genealogies of the Gnostics are held up to ridicule. General references are numerous. Diseases are caused by evil spirits. We must cut off any offending member. Thus we are saved. In him we breathe and move and have our being. The higher divinity begets a son, one among many brethren. As the father of intelligence, God is the father of lights. However, the most interesting incident is that scriptural text which, to the reflecting, is always so much of a puzzle. If the light that is in them be darkness, etc. This is explained by the Platonic theory that we see because of a special light that is within the eye. Theological References General theological references may be grouped under three heads. The soul's salvation, the procession of the divinity, and the trinity. As to the soul's salvation, God is the opposite of the evil of beings, which, when created in honor of the divinity, is the image of the word, the interpreter of the one, and is composed of several elements. But it is a fall from God, and its fate is connected with the parousia. This going forth of the soul from God, when considered cosmically, becomes the procession of the soul. This is the eternal generation, whereby the Son is begotten from eternity, so that there could be no Arian, in hote uk en, or time when he was not. This is expressed as light of light, and explained by the Athanasian light and ray simile. We find even the Johannine and Philonic distinction between God and the good. The world is the first begotten, and the intelligence is the Logos of the first God, as the hypostasis of wisdom is usia, or being, and it is the 
universal reason. As to the Trinity, Plotinus is the first and chief rationalizer of the cosmic trinity, which he continuously and at length discusses. God is father and son, and they are homoousian, or consubstantial. The human soul, as image of the cosmic divinity, is one nature in three powers. Elsewhere we have discussed the history of the term persons, but we may understand the result of that process best by Plotinus's simile of the Trinity as one hand with three faces, in which the persons bear out their original meaning of masks, personare. Henceforward, the Trinity was an objective idea. Note. Although mentioned above, special attention should be given to the parable of the vine and the branches. Ennead 3, Book 3, Chapter 7. Chronologically, Ennead 48, page 1088, with the Gospel of John, Chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, and the divinities begetting a son. Ennead 5, Book 8, Chapter 12. Chronologically, Ennead 31, page 571. The significant aspect of this is that it is represented as being the content of the supreme ecstatic vision, what you might call the crown of Plotinus's message. He tells us that he has seen the divinity beget an offspring of an incomparable beauty, producing everything in himself, and without pain preserving within himself what he has begotten. His son has manifested himself externally. By him, as by an image, Colossians chapter 1 verse 15, you may judge of the greatness of his father. Enjoying the privilege of being the image of his eternity. End of Platonic Studies, Part 5. Platonic Studies, Part 6, by Kenneth Sylvan Guthrie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. 6. Plotinus's Indebtedness to Numenius. 1. Historical Relations Between Numenius and Plotinus. We have elsewhere pointed out the historic connections between Numenius and Plotinus. Here it may be sufficient to recall that Amelius, native of Numenius's hometown of Apamea, and who had copied and learned by heart all the works of Numenius, and who later returned to Apamea to spend his declining days, bequeathing his copy of Numenius's works to his adopted son, Gentilianus Hesychius, was the companion and friend of Plotinus during his earliest period, editing all Plotinus's books until displaced by Porphyry. We remember also that Porphyry was Amelius's disciple before his spectacular quarrel with Amelius, later supplanting him as editor of the works of Plotinus. Plotinus also came from Alexandria, where Numenius had been carefully studied and quoted by Origen and Clement of Alexandria. Further, Porphyry records twice that accusations were popularly made against Plotinus, that he had plagiarized from Numenius. In view of all this historical background, we have the prima facie right to consider Plotinus chiefly as a later restater of the views of Numenius, 
at least during his earlier or a million period such a conception of the state of affairs must have been in the mind of that monk who in the escorial manuscript substituted the name of numenius for that of plotinus on that fragment about matter which begins directly with numenius's name of the divinity being and essence two numenius as father of neoplatonism let us compare with this historical evidence that which supports the universally admitted dependence of Plotinus on his teacher Ammonius. We have only two witnesses, Heracles and Nemesius, and the latter attributes the argument for the immateriality of the soul to Ammonius and Numenius jointly. No doubt Ammonius may have taught Plotinus in his youth but so no doubt did other teachers and of ammonius the only survivals are a few pages preserved by nemesius the testimony for plotinus's dependence on numenius is therefore much more historical as well as significant in view of numenius having left written records that were widely quoted the title of father of neoplatonism therefore if it must at all be awarded, should go to Numenius, who had written a History of the Platonic Succession, wherein he attempts to restore original Platonism. This fits the title Neoplatonism, whereas the philosophy of Ammonius would be better described as an eclectic synthesis of Platonism and Aristotelianism. 3 contrast between them of course we shall admit that there are differences between plotinus and numenius at least during his porphyrian period this was inevitable while dismissing his numenian secretary amelius a friend who had become imbued with such doctrines before becoming the friend of plotinus who persevered in them and wrote in justification thereof. We find that the book chronologically preceding this one is Ennead V, Book V, on the very subject at issue between Amelius and Porphyry. Plotinus took his stand with the latter, and therefore against the former, and through him against Numenius, and indeed we find him opposing several Gnostic opinions, which can be substantiated in Numenius, the creation by illumination or emanation, the threefoldness of the Creator, and the pilot's forgetting himself in his work. But, after all, these points are not as important as they might seem, for in a very little while we find Plotinus himself admitting the substance of all of these ideas, except the verbiage. He himself uses the light and ray simile, the light of light. He himself distinguishes various phases of the allegedly single intelligence, and the soul as pilot of the body incarnates by the very forgetfulness by which the Creator created. Further, as we shall show, during his last, or Eustachian period, after Porphyry had taken a trip to Sicily to avoid suicide, he himself was to return to Numenian standpoints. This may be shown in a general way as follows. Of the nine Eustachian essays, only two betray no similarities to Numenian ideas, while seven do. On the contrary, in the Amelio Porphyrian period, written immediately on Amelius's dismissal, only six are Numenian, and six are non Numenian. In the succeeding Holy Porphyrian period, we have the same equal number of Numenian and non Numenian books. An explanation of this reversion to Numenian ideas 
has been attempted in the study of the development in Plotinus's views. On the whole, therefore, Plotinus's opposition to Numenius may be considered no more than episodic. 4. Direct Indebtedness of Plotinus to Numenius as Plotinus was in the habit of not even putting his name to his own notes, as even in the times of Porphyry the actual authorship of much that he wrote was already disputed, as even Porphyry acknowledges principles and quotations were borrowed, we must discover Numenian passages by their content rather than by any external indications. As the great majority of Numenius's works are irretrievably lost, we may never hope to arrive at a final solution of the matter, and we shall have to restrict ourselves to that which, in Plotinus, may be identified by what Numenian fragments remain. What little we can thus trace definitely will give us a right to draw the conclusion to much more and to the opinion that, especially in his Amelian period, Plotinus was chiefly indebted to Numenian inspiration. We can consider the mention of Pythagoreans, who had treated of the intelligible as applying to Numenius, whose chief work was On the Good, and On the Immateriality of the Soul. The first class of passages will be such as bear explicit reference to quotation from an ancient source. Of such we have five. That is why the Pythagoreans were, among each other, accustomed to refer to this principle in a symbolic manner, calling him a polo, which name means a denial of manifoldness. That is the reason of the saying, the ideas and numbers are born from the indefinite doubleness and the one, for this is intelligence. That is why the ancients said that ideas are essences and beings. Let us examine the general view that evils cannot be destroyed, but are necessary. The divinity is above being. A sixth case is How manifoldness is derived from the first. A seventh case is the whole passage on the triunity of the divinity, including the term Father. Among doctrines said to be handed down from the ancient philosophers are the ascents and descents of souls, and the migrations of souls into bodies other than human. The soul is a number. Moreover, Plotinus wrote a book on the incorruptibility of the soul, as Numenius had done, and both authors discuss the incorporeity of qualities. Besides these passages, where there is a definite expression of dependence on earlier sources, there are two in which the verbal similarity is striking enough to justify their being considered references. Besides, no body could subsist without the power of the universal soul. Because bodies, according to their own nature, are changeable, inconstant, and infinitely divisible, and nothing unchangeable remains in them. There is evidently need of a principle that would lead them, gather them, and bind them fast together, and this we name soul. This similarity is so striking that it had already been observed and noted by Bouillet. Compare we consider that all things called essences are composite, and that not a single one of them is simple. With Numenius, 
who believes that everything is thoroughly mingled together and that nothing is simple. 5. Uncertain Indebtedness of Plotinus As Plotinus does not give exact quotations and references, it is difficult always to give their undoubted source. As probably Platonic, we may mention the passage about the universal soul taking care of all that is inanimate, and when one has arrived at individuals, they must be abandoned to infinity. Also, other quotations. The line, It might be said that virtues are actualizations, might be Aristotelian. We also find, thus, according to the ancient maxim, courage, temperance, all the virtues, even prudence, are but purifications. That is the reason that it is right to say that the soul's welfare and beauty lie in assimilating herself to the divinity. This sounds platonic, but might be Numenian. In this connection it might not be uninteresting to note passages in Numenius which are attributed to Plato, but which are not to be identified. O men, the mind which you dimly perceive is not the first mind, but before this mind is another one which is older and diviner. That the good is one. We turn now to thoughts found identically in Plotinus and Numenius, although no textual identity is to be noted. We may group these according to the subject, the universe and the soul. 6. Particular Similarities God is Supreme King. Eternity is now but neither past nor future. The king in heaven is surrounded by leisure. The good is above being. The divinity is the unity above the being and essence. And connected with this is the unitary interpretation of the name E. Polo, following in the footsteps of Plutarch. Nevertheless, the inferior divinity traverses the heavens in a circular motion, while Numenius does not specify this motion as circular, it is implied inasmuch as the creators passing through the heavens must have followed their circular course. With this perfect motion is connected the peculiar Numenian doctrine of inexhaustible giving, which gave a philosophical basis for the old simile of radiation of light, so that irradiation is the method of creation, and this is not far removed from emanationism. This process consists of the descent of the intelligible into the material, or as Numenius puts it, that both the intelligible and the perceptible participate in the ideas. Thus intelligence is the uniting principle that holds together the bodies whose tendency is to split up and scatter, making a leakage or waste, which process invades even the divinity. This uniting of scattering elements produces a mixture or mingling of matter and reason, which, however, is limited to the energies of the existent, not to the existent itself. All things are in a flow, and the whole all is in all. The divinity creates by glancing at the intelligence above as a pilot. The divinity is split by overattention to its charges. This leads us over to consideration of the soul. The chief effort of Numenius is a polemic against the materialism of the Stoics, and to it Plotinus devotes a whole book. All souls, 
even the lowest are immortal even qualities are incorporeal the soul therefore remains incorporeal the soul however is divisible this explains the report that numenius taught not various parts of the soul but two souls which would be opposed by plotinus in his polemic against the stoics but taught in another place such divisibility is indeed implied in the formation of presentation as a by-product or a common part moreover the soul has to choose its own demon or guardian divinity salvation as a goal appears in numenius but not in plotinus who opposes the gnostic idea of the saved souls though elsewhere he speaks of the paths of the musician lover and philosopher in reaching ecstasy still both gnostics and plotinus insisted on the need of a saviour memory is actualization of the soul in the highest ecstasy the soul is alone with the alone seven similarities applied differently this comparison of philosophy would have been much stronger had we added thereto the following points in which we find similar terms and ideas but which are applied differently the soul is indissolubly united to intelligence according to plotinus but to its source with numenius plotinus makes discord the result of their fall while with numenius it is its cause guilt is the cause of the fall of souls with plotinus but with numenius it is impulsive passion the great evolution or world process is by plotinus called the eternal procession while with numenius it is progress the simile of the pilot is by plotinus applied to the soul within the body while with numenius it refers to the logos or creator in the universe while in both cases the cause of creation for the creator and incarnation for the soul is forgetfulness there is practically no difference here however doubleness is by plotinus predicated of the sun and stars but by numenius of the demiurge himself which plotinus opposes as a gnostic teaching the philonic term legislator is by plotinus applied to intelligence while numenius applies it to the third divinity and not the second plotinus extends immortality to animals but numenius even to the inorganic realm including everything while numenius seems to believe in the serapistic and gnostic demons plotinus opposes them although in his biography he is represented as taking part in the evocation of his guardian spirit in a temple of isis we thus find a tolerably complete body of philosophy shared by plotinus and numenius out of the few fragments of the latter that have come down to us it would therefore be reasonable to suppose that if numenius's complete works had survived we could make out a still far stronger case for plotinus's dependence on numenius at any rate the dominican scribe at the escorial who inserted the name of numenius in the place of that of plotinus in the heading of the fragment about matter must have felt a strong confusion between the two authors eight philosophical relations between numenius and plotinus to begin with we have the controversy with the stoics which though it appears in the works of both bears in each a different significance while with numenius it absorbed his chief controversial efforts 
with Plotinus it occupied only one of his many spheres of interest, and indeed he had borrowed from them many terms, such as pneuma, the spiritual body, and others set forth elsewhere. Notable, however, was the term hexis, habituation or form of inorganic objects, and the fantasia or sense presentation. Like them, the name Apollo is interpreted as a denial of manifoldness. Next, in importance, as a landmark, is Numenius's chief secret, the name of the divinity as being and essence, which reappears in Plotinus in numberless places. Connected with this is the idea that essence is intelligence. 9. Pythagorean Similarities It is a commonplace that Numenius was a Pythagorean, or at least was known as such, for, though he reverenced Pythagoras, he conceived of himself as a restorer of true Platonism. It will therefore be all the more interesting to observe what part numbers play in their system, especially in that of Plotinus, who made no special claim to be a Pythagorean disciple. First we find that numbers and the divine ideas are closely related. Numbers actually split the unity of the divinity. The soul also is considered as a number, and in connection with this we find the Pythagorean sacred tetractus. Thus numbers split up the divinity, though it is no more than fair to add that elsewhere Plotinus contradicts this and states that the multiplicity of the divinity is not attained by division. Still, this is not the only case in which we will be forced to array Plotinus against himself. The first effect of the splitting influence of numbers will be doubleness, which, though present in intelligence, nevertheless chiefly appears in matter, as the Pythagorean indefinite dyad. Still, even the supreme is double, so we must not be surprised if he is constituted by a trinity in connection with which the supreme appears as grandfather. If, then, both Numenius and Plotinus are really under the spell of Pythagoras, it is pretty sure they will not be materialist. They will believe in the incorporeality of the divinity, of qualities, and of the soul, which will be invisible and possess no extension. A result of this will be that the soul will not be located in the body or in space, but rather the body in the soul. From this incorporeal existence there is only a short step to unchangeable existence or eternity. This, to the soul, means immortality, one theory of which is reincarnation. To the universe, however, this means harmony. There are still other Pythagorean traces in common between Numenius and Plotinus. The cause that the indeterminate dyad split off from the divinity is tolma, rashness or boldness. Everything outside of the divinity is in a continual state of flux. Evil is then that which is opposed to good. It also is therefore unavoidable, inasmuch as suppression of its cosmic function would entail cosmic collapse. The world stands thus as an inseparable combination of intelligence and necessity or chance. 10. Platonic Traces Platonic traces there would naturally be, but it will be noticed that they are far less numerous than the Pythagorean. To begin with, we find the reverent spirit 
towards the divinities which praise for their blessing at the inception of all tasks to us who live in these latter days such a prayer seems out of place in philosophy but that is only because we have divorced philosophy from theology in other words because our theology has left the realm of living thought and being fixed once for all we are allowed to pursue any theory of existence we please as if it had nothing whatever to do with any reality in other words we are deceiving ourselves on the contrary in those days every philosophical speculation was a genuine adventure in the spiritual world a magical operation that might unexpectedly lead to the threshold of the cosmic sanctuary wise indeed therefore was he who began it by prayer of other technical platonic terms there are quite a few the lower is always the image of the higher so the world might be considered the statue of the divinity the ideas are in a realm above the world the soul here below is as in a prison there is a divinity higher than the one generally known the divinity is in a stability resultant of firmness and perfect motion the perfect movement therefore is circular this intercommunion of the universe therefore results in matter appearing in the intelligible world as intelligible matter by dialectics also called bastard reasoning we abstract everything till we reach the thing in itself or in other words matter as a substrate of the world thus we metaphysically reach ineffable solitude the same goal is reached psychologically however in the ecstasy this idea occurred in plato only as a poetic expression of metaphysical attainment and in the case of plotinus at least may have been used as a practical experience chiefly to explain his epileptic attacks and this would be all the more likely as this disease was generally called the sacred disease whether numenius also was an epileptic we are not told it is more likely he took the idea from philo or philo's oriental sources at least numenius seems to claim no personal ecstatic experiences such as those of plotinus we have entered the realm of psychology and this teaches us that that in which numenius and plotinus differ from plato and philo is chiefly their psychological or experimental application of pure philosophy no body could subsist without the soul to keep it together various attempts are made to describe the nature of the soul it is the extent or relation of circumference to circle or it is like a line and its divergence in any case the divinity and the soul move around the heavens and this may explain the otherwise problematical progress or evolution prosodos or stolos of ours eleven various similarities there are many other unclassifiable numenian traces in plotinus two of them however are comparatively important first is a reaffirmation of the ancient greek connection between generation fertility of birth of souls and wetness which is later reaffirmed by porphyry in his cave of the nymphs plotinus however later denies this then we come to a genuine innovation of numenius's his theory of divine or intelligible giving plato had of course in his genial casual way 
sketched out a whole organic system of divine creation and administration of this world. The conceptions he needed he had cheerfully borrowed from earlier Greek philosophy without any rigid systematization, so that he never noticed that the hinge on which all was supposed to turn was merely the makeshift of an assumption. This capital error was noticed by Numenius, who sought to supply it by a psychological observation, namely that knowledge may be imparted without diminution. Plotinus, with his winning way of dispensing with quotation marks, appropriated this, as also the idea that life streams out upon the world in the glance of the divinity, and as quickly leaves it when the divinity turns away his glance. Other less important points of contact are the Egyptian ship of souls, the philonic distinction between the God as supreme and God as subordinate, the hoary equivocation on cosmos, and the illustration of the divine Logos as the pilot of the world. End of Platonic Studies, Part 6《Platonic Studies》Part Seven by Kenneth Sylvan Guthrie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jeffrey Edwards. Seven. Value of Plotinus. Importance in the past. We must focus our observations on Plotinus as a philosopher. To begin with, we should review his successors, Porphyry, Iamblichus, Sallust, Proclus, Hierocles, Simplicius, Macrobius, Priscus, Olympiodorus, and John Philoponus. Among the Arabian philosophers that follow in his steps are Maimonides and in Gabriel. Of the Christian fathers, we first have two who paraphrased rather than quoted him. St. Augustine by name quotes Ennead 1, Book 6, Ennead 3, Book 2, Ennead 4, Book 3, and Ennead 5, Book 1. He paraphrases parts of Ennead 1 Book 2, Ennead 2, Book 1, Ennead 3, Books 6 and 7, Ennead 4, Books 2 and 7, Ennead 6, Books 5 and 6. St. Basil so closely paraphrases parts of Plotinus in his treatise on the Holy Spirit, his letter on the monastic life, and his Hexameron, that Bouillet prints the passage in question in deadly parallel. Other Christian Platonic students were Gregory of Nyssa, Synesius, Dionysus the Areopagite, Theodorus, Aeneas of Gaza, Gennadius, Victorinus, Nicephorus, Cumnus, and Cassiodorus. Thomas Aquinas also was much indebted to Plotinus, and after him came Boethius, Fenelon, Bosnet, and Leibniz, all quoted in Bouillet's work. We have frequently pointed out that Plotinus's bastard reasoning, process of reaching the intelligible, was practically paraphrased by Kant's dialectical path to the thing in itself. This dialectic, of course, was capitalized by Hegel. Drews has shown that Eduard von Hartmann 
used Plotinus's semi-devotional ecstasy as a metaphysical basis for his philosophy of the unconscious. It is, of course, among mystics that Plotinus has been accorded the greater honor. His practical influence descended through the visions and ecstasies of the saints down to Swedenborg, who attempted to write the theology of the ecstasy and the relation between these two. Swedenborg and Plotinus should prove a fertile field for investigation. Cultural Importance Summarizing, he formed a bridge between the pagan world with its Greco-Roman civilization and the modern world in three departments. Christianity, philosophy, and mysticism. So long as the traditional Platonico-Stoical feud persisted, there was no hope of progress, because it kept apart two elements that were to fuse into the Christian philosophy. Numenius was the last Platonist, as Posidonius was the last Stoic combatant. However, if reports are to be trusted, Ammonius was an eclecticist who prided himself on combining Plato with Aristotle. If Plotinus was indeed his disciple, it was the theory eclecticism that he took from his reputed teacher. Practically, he was to accomplish it by his dependence on the Numenian Amelius, the Stoic Porphyry, and the negative Eustachius. It will be seen, therefore, that his chief importance was not in spite of his weakness, but most because of it. By repeatedly boxing the compass, he thoroughly assimilated the best of the conflicting schools, and became of interest to a sufficiency of different groups, Christian, philosophical, and mystical, to ensure preservation, study, and quotation. His habit of omitting credit to any but ancient thinkers left his own work to the uninformed, who constituted all but a minimal number, as a body of original thought. Thus he remains to us the last light of Greece, speaking a language with which we are familiar, and leaving us quotations that are imperishable. Personal Value While therefore providentially Plotinus has ever been of great importance theologically, philosophically, and mystically, we cannot leave him without honestly facing the question of his value as an original thinker. It is evident that his success was in inverse ratio to originality, but we can also see that he could not have held together those three spheres of interest without the momentum of a wonderful personality. This will be evident at a glance to any reader of his biography. But, after all, we are here concerned not so much with his personality as with his value as an original thinker. This question is mooted by and cannot be laid aside because of its decisive influence on the problem of his dependence on Numenius. The greater part of the latter's work being irretrievably lost, we can judge only from what we have, and as to the rest we must ask ourselves, was Plotinus the kind of a man who would have depended on some other man's thoughts? Is he likely to have sketched out a great scheme and filled it in? Or rather, was he likely to depend on personal suggestion and embroider on it, so to speak? Elsewhere we have demonstrated a development of his opinions, for instance about matter. Was this due to progressiveness or to indefiniteness? The reader must judge for himself. Personal Limitations His epilepsy naturally created an opportunity for, 
and need of a doctrine of ecstasy, which for normal people should be no more than a doctrine, or at least be limited to conscious experiences. Even his admirer, Porphyry, acknowledges that he spelled and pronounced incorrectly. He acknowledged that without Porphyry's objections he would have nothing to say. He refrained from quoting his authorities, and Porphyry acknowledged that his writings contained many Stoic and Aristotelian doctrines. It was generally brooded about that his doctrines were borrowed from Numenius, to the extent that his disciples held controversies and wrote books on the subject. His style is enigmatic, and the difficulty of understanding him was discussed even in his own day. He was dependent on secretaries or editors, first on Amelius, later on Porphyry, who does not scruple to acknowledge he added many explanations. Later, Plotinus sent his books to Porphyry in Sicily to edit. No doubt, the defectiveness of his eyesight made both reading and writing difficult, and explains his failure to put titles to his works, though, as in the case of Virgil, such hesitation may have been the result of a secret consciousness of his indebtedness to others. Reliance on Punning Punning has, of course, a hoary antiquity, and even the revered Plato was an adept at it, as we see in his Cratylus. Moreover, not till a man's work is translated can we uncover all the unconscious cases of undistributed middle. Nevertheless, in an inquiry as to the permanent objective validity of a train of reasoning, we are compelled to note extent and scope of his tendency. So he puns on eons, on science and knowledge, on Agalmata, on Aphrodite, as delicate, on being, on Koros, as creation or adornment, on difference in others, on idea, on heaven, world, universe, animal and all, on Westa and standing, on Hexis, on inclination, on doxa, on love and vision, on enai and henos, on nous, noesis, and to noephon, on paskin, on poros, on prometheus and providence, on reason and characteristic, on skesis and schema, and soma, and sozethai, on suffering, on thinking, thinkable, and intellection, on timely and sovereign. It will be noted that these puns refer to some of the most important conceptions, and are found in all periods of his life. We must therefore conclude that his was not a clear-thinking ability, that he depended on accidental circumstances, and may not always have been fully conscious how far he was following others. This popular judgment, that he was revamping Numenius's work, may then not have been entirely unfounded, as we indeed have shown. Nevertheless, he achieved some permanent work, that will never be forgotten. For instance, 1 his description of the ecstatic state. 2. His polemic against the Aristotelian and Stoic categories. 3. His establishment of his own categories. 4. His allegoric treatment of the birth of love, the several eroses, poros and penia, and other myths. 5 his building of a Trinitarian philosophy, 6. His threefold spheres, 
of existence, underlying Swedenborgian interpretation. 7. His aesthetic theories. 8. His ethical studies of virtues and happiness. 9. His restatement of Numenius's arguments for the immateriality of the soul. Selected Maxims the reader may be interested in a few maxims selected from Plotinus's works which may be of general interest. 1. We develop toward ecstasy by simplification of soul. 2. We rise by the flight of the single to the single, face to face. 3. We contain something of the supreme. 4. The soul becomes what she remembers and sees. 5. Everything has a secret power. 6. The best men are those who have most intimacy with themselves. 7. The touch of the good man is the greatest thing in the world. 8. Every being is its best not when great or numerous, but when it belongs to itself. 9. There are two men in us, the better and the worse. 10. The secret of life is to live simultaneously with others and yourself. 11. God is the author of liberty. 12. Concerning what? would it be most worthwhile to speak except the soul? Let us therefore know ourselves. 13. Without virtue, God is but a name. 14. The object of virtue is to separate the soul from the body. 15. We can never become perfect, because he who thinks himself so has already forgotten the supreme divinity towards which he must hasten. 16. The world was created by a concurrence of intelligence and necessity. 17. The soul is the image, word, and interpreter of the one. 18. The divinities, though present to many human beings, often reveal themselves only to some one person, because he alone is able to contemplate them. 19. To act without suffering is the sign of a great power. 20. Only virtue is independent. 21. We are beautiful when we know ourselves. 22. The soul is the child of the universal father. 23. True happiness is being wise, and exercising this within oneself. 24. To become again what one was originally is to live in the superior world. 25. The desired goal is not to cease failing, but to grow divine. 26. Virtue demands preliminary purification. 27. Our effort at assimilation should be directed not at mere respectability, but at the gods themselves. 28. One should study mathematics in order to accustom oneself to think of incorporeal things, and to believe in their existence. 29. Soul is not in body, but body in soul. 30. The soul's higher part remains in heaven. 31. We should not leave the earth, but not be of it. 32. The object of life is not to avoid evil or copy the good, but to become good. 33. Dying to Eustachius. I am awaiting you in order to draw the divine in me to the divine in all.
End of Part 7 and End of Platinic Studies by Kenneth Sylvan Guthrie and End of Enneads by Plotinus Translated by Kenneth Sylvan Guthrie Read by Geoffrey Edwards Proof listened by David Craig Meta-coordinated by Anise